Hi, Janelle Schaefer here with Sheep Hill Herbs. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to another video. And it is another interview video, which I love doing these types of videos. I know that my, excuse me, my um, audio is not as nice when I do them this way, but the content is, uh, I feel really great. I love meeting different people who are working with plants and sharing that on um, this channel. So today I will be talking with a friend, someone I've known for quite a while, a couple of years, and I've interviewed her before uh, for my herbs magazine. Her name is Alicia Warnikoff, and she is an herbalist. And I want to go through her bio as she wrote it for me. So I'm going to be looking back and forth to my sheet, and I hope you don't mind, but I want to get it just right. So Alicia's plant journey began about 20 years ago when she was 15 years old. She was serving in missions in Chile, and the father began to orchestrate a calling over her life to serve people through plants and natural medicine. She began to mentor under some great herbalists in her home state of California, and the father blessed each step, always providing someone to pour in generations of knowledge into her life. She lived with the Mapuche, and I hope I'm saying that right, people of the Southern Andes in Chile, where she learned to see plants as a vital part of everyday life. And the great opportunity that this was, was to be able to serve others by teaching them these ways. When she moved to Tennessee in 2006, she began to spend several hours every day outdoors. Most of life was spent in the woods, fields and streams, intently learning each plant, mushroom, ecosystem, and for, sorry, foraging method she could, committing them to memory and learning their uses as food and medicine. She studied through an herb school for four years as well, but definitely believes that creation and the creator are the best teachers by far. Alicia is carrying on her native legacy as a Powhatan and Wampanoag women, woman, oh, I'm butchering these names. I'll have to ask her to say that for us. And honoring that heritage by teaching the people of the ancient and crucial skills. Over the course of 20 years, she has been a student, teacher, instructor, mentor, writer, speaker, entrepreneur, but mostly she likes to focus on using what God has called her to do and serve those around her. So that is the introduction that I have for her, but um, I guess I could give my own personal introduction. I found Alicia, I believe through, through some sort of social media. I don't remember if it was Facebook or, or Instagram, one of those. And I found her videos where she um, she, she talks a lot in her videos about native species, plants that are found in the wild, not necessarily culinary herbs in your garden, but a lot of wild plants. And she is extremely knowledgeable, knowing the scientific names and uses. Uh, she's a, a very good teacher, very good speaker. She um, has a very peaceful and a humble way about her. And I just really was drawn to her way of teaching and I've got to know her a lot better when I interviewed her a few years ago. So as I have been growing my own YouTube channel, I really wanted to include her because of her plant knowledge and also because we share um, a spiritual connection with uh, believing in Yahweh, the father, the creator. So as I, I have said father many times in her in um, introduction, the father is the creator, uh, our heavenly father. So I'm really happy and excited to share this interview and we're gonna get started in just a second. So I wanna ask you to like, subscribe, hit the bell button, leave a comment down below. If you're new to herbs, um, let us know, just say, you know, hi, I'm trying to learn about herbs and um, I will make sure I respond to your comments. So Alicia is here with us today, and I'm really happy to see her and talk with her and listen to all of her plant wisdom. How are you doing, Alicia? How are things where you are in your part of the world? Doing really good. At the moment, we're expecting severe weather, like in half an hour. So 
I'm kind of, I don't know. I like severe weather. It's like the raw power of nature. (laughs) Uh, I'm excited to see like wind and rain and possible hail. So I'm me and my mom both. We're like weather gals, but yeah, we're that's what we're doing right now. It's hunkering down. Well, we we had time enough for the interviews. That was great. Yeah, we got to get that in then before the the weather. We have sunny, beautiful sunny weather right now. Um, are you, is it spring blooming? I, if it's cloudy today, it's probably not, the plants kind of stay closed, but are you experiencing a lot of spring yes. growth and everything coming up around you? So it's been a really weird spring for me because March 3rd, um, we had to come down to Houston, here to Houston, Mm. because there was a big um, freeze. I don't know if you guys remember that, like in February, uh, all of Texas just froze froze over and there was snow and Texas isn't built for that. So um, we work in catastrophe zones and things like that. So they called us down late February. And so March 3rd, um, my kids and I traveled back down to Houston to be with my husband. And the day we left, we were driving out of our driveway and I noticed the daffodils were blooming in Tennessee. And I went, no, I literally waited all, you know, all winter to see spring. Oh. And the day we left was the first time of spring. So um, of course we live in the Smoky Mountains and it's just like the most biodiverse area in the United States. And that's why we live there is because I'm a plant freak and we love the mountains. So I miss all of Tennessee spring um, and we're not going back yet. So I'll probably miss it. But uh, Texas has been beautiful. The famous Texas blue bonnets have been blooming and the Indian paint brushes. And then there's some things that we have that kind of overlap that I've been enjoying that are starting to bloom now. And, um, yeah. Oh, well, great. Well, um, Alicia and I talked about like what we would discuss in this interview. And uh, because she knows so much about plants we decided that uh, it would would be great if she could share like a bunch of her favorite plants that grow in the wild, um, not as well known, not as typical. So Alicia, what what do you have to share today? Which plants are the stars okay. for yeah. this talk? I was thinking about it and I was thinking, you know, you can find so much information on things like chickweed or dandelion. I mean, there's so much information. But there's certain herbs that I use almost every day, um, you know, every week, if not every day, um, that are hard to find information on. And so I chose to talk about those um, because I'm really into getting people to using what's around them. So sometimes there's like a really good herb that people might buy, but it grows in India or it grows in China or only grows on the West Coast. And I'm really into getting people to that there's herbs right around them that have the same medicinal actions um but because you know a west coast species let's say like uva ursi you know um Mm -hmm. it's more of a west coast species but there is um an equivalent to that that grows in the east so if people would realize those kinds of things they could just um gather what's around them and not you know get a mail ordered herbs all the time but you could actually get no if not 100 percent of your medicine from right around you a good portion of it like 90 percent so i'm always trying to find herbs that um are the equivalent to what i might need that i find myself ordering a lot of yeah um so i chose to talk about those things today and i just thought of another really good one i didn't add to my list but i'll have to mention that one in a second so um so yeah, what is your first hard one to buy. and uh yeah must be forged and some of these are they're either hard to buy or they're really just better fresh and you can't buy fresh herbs as easily through the mail. So the first one I chose is the liar leaf sage. That's the salvia lorata. And I think, you know, I don't know the distribution of that plant um, exactly, but I know that it grows east of the Mississippi and I find that it's all over the place here in Texas, like field fold. And I didn't know that it would grow wow. in Texas, but it, it loves this weather. Mm-hmm. So I suspect that it grows probably not in desert areas. Um, I don't know about Colorado. I don't remember seeing it there, but I know that it's available to a good portion of the US. Um, And if you didn't have liar leaf sage, um, because it's a salvia, again, there's so many sages that grow native in the US that wherever you are, you could take your native sage and you can use that one, probably the same way that I'm talking about this one. So salvia lorata, it doesn't look like your typical sage. Like it's not like a white, um, woolly leaf. I wish I had 
pictures and visuals for you, but if you want to um, Google image, if you're going, I don't know that plan, I want to know what it looks like, Google image or do a search on salvia lorata images or identification on all of these plants that I'm talking about because I don't just have visuals for you here or live plant specimens. So the great thing about um, this is it's really abundant here. It's not something that um, is endangered or threatened in any way. Okay. And it grows in fields. There's just like millions of them all in one field, you know, so you don't even have to like pick 10 here and pick 10 there. You can just go for it and like get your kids on it. I mean, it's like acres of this grow at one time. Now, sometimes you'll, you will find them just kind of growing sporadically throughout a lawn or something that hasn't been um, mowed, but it's got your typical sage action. So it's antimicrobial, it's astringent, it's antifungal, um, anti-inflammatory, and it's great for digestion. So the way that I use it most, and I was thinking about this when I was writing notes for this, I was like, you know, I really use this for any time something's wrong right here. <laughs> Whether that be like itchy eyes, okay, um, scratchy, okay. scratchy, runny nose, like, you know, your ears start itching and you're like, oh, I feel like a, a cold or something is coming on. Or you get like tight throat or scratchy throat. All of those symptoms is when I really first think uh, lyre leaf sage. And I typically uh, combine that with goldenrod, the, the solidago canadensis or whatever goldenrod, again, that you have okay. where you are. With, um, all, of, all the goldenrods are... Um, are medicinal in the same way. So the candidensis is the one that we have. So I would do lyre leaf sage and goldenrod and I use them. Um, I actually was showing Janelle a minute ago. I actually, I only brought one tincture with me to Houston because I thought I was going to be here a week or two. I did not think I would be here for months. So I grabbed one thing out the door and the one thing that I grabbed has actually all of the things that I'm talking about today. They really are my favorite. So I just combine them all into one tincture and I kind of use it as a panacea, like whatever's wrong with you, take this. Yeah. All of my kids and my husband have taken this already while we've been here um, in Texas because a little like head cold is floating around. But um, What is your base for that? Food. This is a tincture, this is an alcohol-based tincture. So what I did was I tinctured all of these things separately and then I like to combine things into mixes that I can just take on the go without having to take five or six bottles with me. Okay. Say, this is going to be good. This is gonna be good. So if I were home, then I might grab something to add to this. I might add elderberry or something else. Um, but I just like to make my own little combinations of things mm -hmm. like that I know are specifically going to help what our symptoms mm -hmm. are. But because I didn't know what I was packing mm -hmm. for, I kind of just, my top five, I stuck in there. Um, but the lyre leaf sage is, is great on infections. Um, it's good for just, so I have, I like to put it in a throat spray and just keep it on the, th like keep your throat covered um, throughout the day because really microbes can't live where lyre leaf sage is. So if you spray, it's like it kills down the population. If you start going <laughs> again, spray again or gargle your tincture. Um, and I like to gargle like with my, with my ears kind of to this side and to this side. So it's even getting kind of up into my sinuses and nothing ever comes of a cold when you have this in your pocket. It's just really good stuff. Um, you can also use it to draw infection out topically. So even the seeds can be like, when they're dried, you can put them in a Ziploc and shake it really well. Mm -hmm. And then gather the seeds, that <laughs> grind those up and use them as a really powerful um, topical puller, like to, to even like snake bites, if you're doing venom or um, you had a piece of glass wedged in there, something that draws very well. Um, and then you could use it for infection and stubborn wounds um, or fungal issues topically also. So you could infuse an oil um, and use it topically, or you could make a tincture or a tea or capsules out of it and do it internally. So that was my oh, number wow. one that I chose. To oh my goodness. So, yeah, what would your second herb be? By. You know, you don't just look at Let's see, usnea. Um, so usnea barbata is a lichen. It grows uh, in both conifer and deciduous trees. I've noticed there's, again, there's in California, there's one species in the East Coast. There's another down here in Texas. There's another. Everywhere I go, there's um, a different species, but the usnea barbata can be widely uh, found throughout the United States. And uh, 
so lichens are a uh, fungus and an algae that grow symbiotically together. And so um, it, it can be tinctured, but what I do is a double extract the way that you would do medicinal mushrooms. So you're doing a water extract with an alcohol extract and getting um, the benefits from both of those because some of the constituents that you're, that you're trying to get from the herb are water-based and some can only be extracted with alcohol. So, okay. um, but usnea is again, really mm -hmm. antibacterial, antimicrobial, antiviral, mm -hmm. and it's good against really nasty things like strep and staph um, and pneumonia. And uh, you can use it topically again. So if you had a nasty wound and it's not looking good, you just, you can use a poultice. Mm -hmm. um, you can use it mm -hmm. as an eye wash if you had really red irritated eyes or pink eye or something bacterial in your eyes or even like cats you know my my neighbor said my cat has a, a feral cat showed up and it has just goop in its eyes and I was like man mm -hmm. just get some um usnea tea made up and just try to get that in its eyes and it cleared right up so um you can use it um topically and internally and again it's not something that you find for sale but it's great for colds and coughs and flus and viruses. And you, you can make a tea out of it real quick and just sit there and gargle throughout the day. But again, it's one of those frequent exposure things. So don't just drink one cup of tea, a 10 ounce cup of tea in the morning and say, okay, I'm good to go. Okay. Um, I like to bring in a cup next to me. You can you can even just add it to your the tea that you're, you're drinking. You don't just have to use, you know, usnea because it kind of tastes like Shrek toe jam to me. Like that's what I tell my kids. Get me some Shrek toe jam. <laughs> like it it kind of tastes like it looks. Um, so you can add it to a tea that you're drinking already, and it will it won't take away from those medicinal actions that you're trying to get. Um, but again, just sip and let it cover your throat. Sip, let it cover your throat. And if you're dealing with something like um, staph, you still, you don't want to just uh, guzzle, you know, you want to have it running through your system all day fighting that infection. So that was my second one um, that you can't really buy, but everybody can probably find. Um, my third, I have I'm not going down the list. Yeah. What's that? I have not looked for that plant. Oh, you haven't lived. <laughs> you probably have it all over the place. It I probably only grows, do. I should say it only. Yeah, look around the trees. So it's a little lichen. You'll know that you found the right one when you pull the the string, the filament apart. There's like a little rubber band inside. Um, it, it doesn't just snap. There's like, it kind of springs. Uh, the way chickweed has a little thing running down its stem. You know, same thing yeah. with usnea. Um, you do need to be careful where you gather it because it does absorb um, environmental toxins. But once it starts absorbing environmental toxins, it dies off. So typically you don't even find it in polluted areas. And it's, you can kind of tell the buffer zone where you find mm -hmm. usnea abundantly, that means you have really clean, not polluted air. So you do have to be careful where you gather from. Um, okay. okay. So mimosa, I'm, I kind of love this one. What's that? I said, yeah, what would your third one be? Okay, mimosa, Albizia Julie oh. Brisson is um, the Persian silk tree. And in Asia, it's known as the tree of happiness um, mm -hmm. for a good reason. So this is not a native tree to the United States. It's native um, to Asia. And it's been used over there for as long as history records. So it's it's got thousands of years of um, recorded history and use. And Chinese medicine, they use it a lot of different ways because it, um, and, I, and I haven't, I'm not really good at like focusing on studying Chinese medicine. So there's a lot of things I still don't understand about it on that side of things. But the Western side that we've kind of adopted is that it's calming. Um, it's used for anxiety, it's used for hyperactivity, it's used for like pent up when you're like just angry and agitated and you need to just like chill out. Uh, mimosa is a really great one to take. So you use both the blooming flowers and here they always bloom in June here in Tennessee. Okay. And I actually have them here in Texas all over the place and I expect that they will bloom here in Texas probably in May because everything seems to be a month ahead. Um, so in Tennessee, it's like June 1st, 
June 2nd, they're blooming. Like it's right on schedule all the time. Even if it freezes, it's wild. Um, so it's, you use the blooming flowers and you use the bark and you can use the leaves also. And I really like to use both together because I've noticed that the flowers are uplifting and kind of bubbly and happy and make you feel like carefree. But mm -hmm. the bark is grounding and centering and kind of more like makes you feel um, like you found your center place again, that you're not, you know, your thoughts aren't flying all over the place. You're not just angry and not able to focus on anything else, but your anger or your anxiety or um, when you can't breathe, you know, when you're so stressed out that you feel yourself just breathing from here and you're going <sighs> all the time, you know, um, that's what it's uh, indicated for is just that like pent up in your chest energy and stress and anxiety. So um, a lot of people hate this tree because it does kind of choke out some of our natives, um, but it's not only a beautiful tree, but it's a useful tree. And uh, I wouldn't say like plant one, but I would say definitely use the medicine that's around you, you know, cause they're here to stay. They're not, I don't think they can be eradicated at this point, but they are beautiful. And people always say, I'd love to plant one of those. And I say, don't plant one, just go find one that's already out there. You know? I have, um, I have one mature big one. And then so many little babies have <laughs> rooted themselves. They, but we don't always yes, say we yeah. don't keep them. We don't keep all the babies. I should, but the I love that that tree. Yeah. <laughs> so it's in that Fabri Fabriaceae, the the pea family. You know the the uh -huh. redbuds and the mimosa. They're all in this. So they have these uh, pea pod looking seed the seed pods, and so that's what they just fall by the thousands. And yeah, they real they really 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 spread. Um, but I've learned to love my invasives and not because I want them to invade our, our natives at all, but they're here and they might as well be used. Mm -hmm. um, Japanese honeysuckle is another one that people just hate, 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 but it's one of my favorite medicines, absolutely favorite medicines um, for antiviral and diffusing hot, um, irritated, um, inflamed things. So I didn't put that one on my list. But that was the one that I said, I just remembered another one. Yeah, uh, it was the Wanisera japonica or the honey, the honeysuckles um, is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, let's see, but the official fourth one was St. John's wort. Um, okay. St. John's wort can be bought. Now you can find St. John's wort, you know, capsules and uh, supplements and things like that <clears throat> but there's a native species so the one that you always buy or even if you buy some herbs at an herb store it's going to be hypericum um, perforatum and that's actually a native to uh, Europe and so that's our our native is actually more medicinal but like not widely known at all and that's hypericum um, punctatum so punctatum it's known as like black spotted Joey, if you look at the leaf, it has all these tiny little pockets of resin. It looks like little black pockets all over it. Um, and that's our native species here. And those pockets of resin um, are actually where the, the active medicine is. It's the hypericin that we're after. So if you've ever made like a, a St. John's wort infused oil or tincture, it's just blood red. Go. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, when you make, um, uh, St. John's wort infused oil, it's just beautiful, bright red. If you've ever done like a solar infusion um, of oil, you'll notice it sitting up in the windowsill and it gets redder and redder and redder and redder until it's almost, you can't even see through it. It's just blood red, it's beautiful. So that's all of the hypericin being extracted into the liquid, whether it's, um, whether it's oil or whether it's a tincture. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the medicine that we're after is that hypericin. Um, I think there's another one called hyper, it starts with the F, um, but there's the hypericin um, is what's used as the antidepressant. So I think what mm -hmm. it does is it helps you metabolize more um, melatonin and serotonin, and that's why it gives you that sense of well-being and helps you with depression and anxiety and things like that. But what St. John's wort isn't very well known for is topical um, use or deep, deep tissue healing. So if you have a wound that's years old, you know, just like people who are in wound care or um, the nerves were severed around that area, 
Um, and so because when you don't have pain, your body doesn't always know to send the antibodies and, and healing to that area. So if you have no nerve um, use in that area, then your body won't always send good circulation or healing um, to that area. So what St. John's wort does is it restores a lot of nerves, um, but it also can heal around lack of nerves, um, which is really good. And I like to use it with cayenne because cayenne is so good at um, circulation and kind of drives that medicine to where it needs to be. Okay. And it's really good for as a delivery wow. agent for any any medicine. Um, but I really like St. John wort. And if we're talking about wound care, um, yarrow, something like that, um, really good, good combination there. Um, and it's also, like I was saying, a nerve restorative. So even on things like spinal injuries or um, it's really good for arthritis, but if you wanna make a liniment out of it, um, you can make, what do I add? I, I actually use lidocaine in, in places where it's like a lot of pain. So because lidocaine is like a gel or an ointment, mm -hmm. I would add um, maybe some wintergreen oil to that, um, St. John's wort oil, and like a yarrow tincture actually and I'd mix that all together and then I'd use that topically and it just takes like even really bad arthritis pain away or muscle injury things like that so yeah, that sounds John's wonderful work, but... <laughs> it really has to be used fresh though because I've tried to use I've tried to make both tincture and oil out of um, dried material and the red never came like it didn't infuse it just didn't work so uh, that's why oh, I put yeah. it on my needs to be used fresh list and then also hard to find because you can't really find our native one so that's why i chose to put it on that list oh. um and then the other one next is cottonwood or balsam poplar like people often know this as um the bomb of gilead and people some people in the south call it bomb gilly it's bomb gilly time okay you know, bam gilly um our southern folk, uh, bam, daily time. About January, February is when you want to start looking. I was up in Wisconsin a few years ago, and we were there. I think actually April is when um, their cottonwood buds were were good, and ours are more like January, February. So if you have a good, um, like we have balsam poplar, which is what is it? Populus balsamifera, I think is what it is. Um, they grow in my backyard. We don't have the cottonwood, but most states I've I've been to have cottonwood all over the place. So look around water is where they grow. Um, and you don't really have to climb. These are like giant hundred foot. I mean, they're not maybe the 60 foot trees probably. They're really, really tall trees. You can't just scale them and pick buds. But what you do is they, um, they send up little shoots because they spread really well by their roots. And you can just get the, the shoots um, and get the buds off of those. Or they're really water, they're, they're like a weak plant um, because they grow by water, they grow really fast. So when windstorms come by, all of these buds, um, branches will fall off and you can collect the buds off of there. But again, I say this has to be fresh. Um, it's You can do it fresh or frozen. You can actually order frozen and dried, but I've used all three and fresh is best for sure. But cottonwood is another one of those things that's good, really good internally and externally. Um, internally, it's really potent. So what it is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with beekeeping at all, but propolis um, is that really sticky brown substance that um, if you were to eat it, it almost like makes your mouth go numb and tingly and it just tastes like medicine, but it has this really yummy like resinous smell to it, almost like spicy, honey, resinous. Um, people use uh, propolis salve and you can find it in a throat spray, things like that. But that is um, cottonwood resin is one of the main um, plants that bees forage for to make that propolis. So all of the propolis um, properties are actually coming from the cottonwood or a few other trees and plants that they use. But um, same thing. So if you were to like suck on a cottonwood bud, your whole mouth would kind of just go numb and tingly and um, you'd start just almost like a burning sensation, but it just feels like it's working. It's like you can tell the medicinal actions just kick in right away. And again, it's almost like cinnamony, spicy, just got a really good taste to it but 
it's one of the things that are in my um my little tincture here okay and I have to be careful how much I put in there because my kids won't take it if I just do that they'll go whoa you know if I make them take it straight um so I like to mix it but it's just so good as an expectorant if you were to have like just such a sore throat and you're swallowing and it's like razor blades and you just feel like you have a lot of drainage going on if you were to gargle or take some um cottonwood or the balm of gilead you would just start swallowing like all this stuff down like it just kind of strips all the mucus off where it's not supposed to be and just starts yeah. you know works as a demult mm -hmm. and an expectorant right away it's like immediate um, so I love it for that. It's really good against um, bacteria. I mean, it even when you make an oil out of um, balm of Gilead or the cottonwood, when you make an oil out of it, it lasts for years and years and years because it's so anti everything fungal fungal bacterial that it actually is its own preservative. So you can actually add even a little bit of that to another oil you're trying to preserve mm -hmm. to make the shelf um, make it shelf stable or the shelf life longer um, because it's just so good on those things. Now, topically, it can be used as an anti-inflammatory. So I like to make a, a cream out of it, a face cream mm -hmm. um, with the, it smells good. You don't have to add anything to it. It already smells good, um, but it takes away things like um, psoriasis. It doesn't take away, it soothes and it can heal um, some of the effects of like psoriasis and eczema, or the hot, you know, hot inflamed acne, things like that, because it's very anti-inflammatory on things that are hot and irritated and red and itchy. So another one that's really good um, internally and externally, but it does have the the salicin in there, uh, what's in aspirin, because it's in the willow family. So you would have to be careful if you were on blood thinners or if you were, you know, allergic or sensitive to aspirin, you'd want to keep that in mind. Yes, with, definitely. Um, yes with uh, anything that was in the Willow family, like the Aspens or uh, Poplars um, and Willows, you always wanna be careful with those things. Um, or just, you know, use less or don't swallow. You can gargle and spit it out if you needed to. Um, and then something really similar I found, last one, this is like my bonus one, because I was gonna talk about five, now it's 5.2, um, is gum weed. And I went, I don't even, I should find the um, the Latin name for that real quick because I just say gumweed. You're going to be like, what are you talking about? Curly cup gumweed. So I was in, um, I was in the Rocky Mountains a couple of years ago traveling. And okay, so it says Grindelia squarosa. So it's this really neat plant that I found I'm gonna actually, I wonder if I could show you just a second because some of you are gonna say, we have that in our yard. Okay, so it's this little plant that has what looks like Elmer's glue in the bud. See, this okay. is like a bud, it hasn't opened yet. And it looks like a little bowl of Elmer's glue. Now here's one that's opened, the yellow. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this little plant that's just very low growing. I'd say it only grows like, uh, not even a foot tall but I was wondering I was like I see all this latex just pulling up in this the little cups of these bud flowers I'm like usually when there's latex there's something medicinal so I looked this up a few years ago and I decided I had some ever ever clear because these resinous plants like the cottonwood and the gumweed um they need high proof to be able to break down that resin and make that liquid enough you know to where it's not chunky or stringy or something so I had some Everclear that I was going to use for something else and it didn't work out. And I decided to make this tincture out of gumweed and just see what happened, right? So I took some, just, I think it was two days into making the tincture and I was shaking really well. So it was getting, you know, agitated well. So I took some and oh my good, oh my goodness. I was like, this is my new favorite medicine. I started like there was things were coming up. I didn't know whether I wasn't sick, but I was like starting to go, oh, you know, and I just had, um, it was like getting rid of old stubborn residual, probably from when I was sick in the past and it was still just lingering down there, but it yeah, was just sure. things up. I didn't know we're there. 
So now it's like when people are so sick, even with COVID, when people are getting just that thick, sticky, non-productive mucus where you're hacking and you can't breathe and there's pressure um, of like, you're just, your, your ribs hurt because you're coughing so much, but nothing's happening. The cottonwood and the gumweed both are what I would go to for that, just to, to strip off. Like if you're blowing your nose and nothing's happening, take those. Yeah. So yeah. Well, well, thank you. One of my favorite medicines, my accident. <laughs> Yeah, you were just a, a, a fount of information about plants. I can, I mean, it's so obvious you spend so much time with them, reading and also just like observing and picking and smelling and just being immersed in them. Um, and I think that's like something to like bring up to the viewer. Like I always say you should not just like go try to do something like find plants by yourself, you should probably have someone who knows your area. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. You know, because I, I do like, some plants are easy to identify, but you don't want to misidentify if you're like a newbie. <laughs> right, so my, my thing, um, when I moved from California to Tennessee, I felt like I had to start over. You know, I knew California plants pretty well growing up with them, but Moving to Tennessee gave me that feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm a newbie again. I don't even know. I've been doing this for years, but here I am surrounded by plants I don't know. So what I did is I actually contacted my um, my extension agent who, mm -hmm. who um, graduated with, I think it was pasture management was his. Mm. Um, so he knew a lot of the plants where a lot of the other people mm. in my area didn't, or I didn't have an herbalist nearby that did know um I contacted him and he would come out to the farm and he and I'd have my list I'd say what's this and what's this and what's this and I'd take a picture and I'd write it down and once I had the name then I could go do the research on is it edible medicinal poisonous what can it be used for or what should I you know should I get rid of this plant um and so that that was actually one of my biggest resources was the extension agents but then I always recommend you get a really good full color photograph um, field uh -huh. guide for your area. So don't do black and white yeah. line drawings, so a really good photograph that's, you know, the newer ones have the better photography. You don't want like something from the eighties where it's like 10 feet away and you can tell yeah, it's yeah. red, but you can't see it. Get a really good um, field guide for your area. And I like the Peterson's um, field guide for, our area, but I've narrowed that down even further to like Tennessee wildflowers or weeds of the South. Okay. That's actually a UT, okay. um, a UT textbook that they have. And it's nothing even about medicinal plants. It's about pasture management. It's called weeds of the South. Um, get books like that for your area. So ask your UT guy or um, somebody who works in that department, say, what were the, what were the textbooks or how did you guys learn your plants in, in the university? when they're teaching yeah. you. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be um, a medicinal book. So I've noticed the medicinal books have a lot of information on medicine, but they don't have a lot of information on finding out what that plant is necessarily or how. Okay, do you want me to finish that okay. one sentence before it gets weird? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so um, yeah, I would say just get books that have really good um, images and learn what the plant is before you even learn what the, the medicine or the edibility of it is. So that was yeah. my tip of the day. Well, that is a great tip and I totally, totally agree with you on that. And uh, we'll have to like reconnect after the video because you mentioned a lot of names, plant names. I wanna make sure I have that in the description. And also I wanna put Alicia's, um, connections if she you know whatever you want to share whether it's your youtube or or your website information um and then you mentioned the peterson's field guide so i'll make sure i have that all in the description so i'll, I'll get that from alicia but thank you so much for sharing your plant knowledge with us i loved hearing about plants that um, some of them I'm familiar with, but not super familiar with. So it's it's nice to always learn more myself. So thank you. All right, thank you for having me today. It's always always nice to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well let's stay thank in you. touch. I'm gonna.
click it off and um, hope you have a nice sunny day or the sun comes back out down there after your storm. Tomorrow, tomorrow's a beach day. Oh, yay. <laughs> yep.